All right, so now we're going to talk about changes in ecosystems. All right, so we talked about ecosystems a while back, or actually a few um, classes ago. Remember, the ecosystem is basically the abiotic, the non-living things, and then the biotic things, the living things, uh, working together or living together, right, in the same area. And so now we're going to be talking about changes in ecosystem, specifically ecological succession, right? So how does something go from, like, having no life, just being like rocks, right, or just um, stone, and how does that go into how does that turn into uh, something that has life, right, that has green plants and that has um, insects and animals and all of these things living together? Right. So how do you go from just non living things, abiotic things into biotic um, things? Right. So let's go ahead and get started with this right now. Uh, what is ecological succession? Right. So succession just means like going from one thing to another. So if you have a succession of presidents, it just means, you know, one president uh, leaves and then the next one comes in and then that one leaves and the next one comes in and so on. Right. So it's just kind of replacing something um, in, a, in a line. And so when we're talking about ecological succession. We're talking about like the natural gradual changes and the types of species that live in an area. Right. So, again, things that are out in nature and it slowly changes from one type of, uh, it starts off with plants, right? So from one type of plant to another in a certain area. And so it can be primary or secondary. And remember y'all, primary just means first and secondary, uh, like it sounds, right? Second. And so the gradual, which just means slow, right? The gradual replacement of one plant community by another through natural processes over time, right? And so we're gonna take a look at that and see again, how you go from a barren landscape of just uh, abiotic factors, right? Non-living things to biotic factors, living things. And so let's start with primary succession, right? That makes sense. Primary means first. So we're going to start here first. So it begins in a place without any soil, right? So that is the first step. And again, that's what we're talking about, right? Like abiotic factors, right? Soil is not alive. And so these things usually happen like on the sides of volcanoes, right? In a volcano, when it erupts, lava comes out, right? And that lava is a red hot flowing. It's like melted rock, basically. And it's just kind of flowing all over the place. But once it cools down, it just turns in a, into a solid rock. Right. This happens in landslides. So if it's raining a lot, there's a lot of wet weather and there's a hillside or a mountainside and it's not stable. Then all of a sudden, all that soil, sorry, all of those rocks will come tumbling down off the side of that mountain or the side of that hill. Right. And it's just all like rocks and rubble. Then you have flooding. This happens too sometimes when you have a flood and all of the, the plants and everything in that area just kind of get wiped away and all your and even the, some of the soil gets wiped away. And all you're left with is like the stone and the rocks. So when you have something that's barren, right? And barren just means like without life, uh, nothing there. And so when all of these things are barren, you have to have something called a pioneer species. And when you are the pioneer in something, that means that you're the first to do it, right? So a pioneer species is basically the first organisms that colonize an area. And to colonize, it just basically means you go and you take over that area, right? So that is what's happening here with these pioneer species. They're the first ones that are going to take over an area. So a living thing that, because organism is living, right? So it's the first living thing that is going to go take over this barren landscape, right? Something that's just basically like rock and stone. And so first you have what are known as lichens, right? That CH is pronounced as a K. So that's first lichens that do not need soil to survive. They grow on rocks, right? So that's what you got to remember is that lichens, they don't need soil. Most green things, most living or most organisms, right, producers are going to need uh, some kind of soil. But these guys don't, right? These guys, lichen can grow on rocks. And let's see. Uh, oh, sorry. And then after the lichen, next you get mosses, right? Mosses grow to hold newly made soil. So if you don't have anything there, like a moss kind of collects dirt, right? If you don't have anything on a rock and the soil tries to, to settle down on the rock, if a little bit of wind blows, it's just going to blow that soil right off, right? And you're never going to start uh, growing anything on those rocks if soil just keeps getting blown away, right? But moss, moss will grow onto those rocks, and moss is kind of like a, like a carpet, right? And if you know anything about carpets, they get dirty really fast, right? Because they all this, the dirt and all the, the trash kind of gets stuck in the carpet, right? And that's why you need a vacuum to vacuum it out. Well, and the same thing happens with the moss, right? If moss starts growing on a rock, all of a sudden dirt starts getting stuck in there and little pieces of, of this and that get, start, get stuck in the moss. And so eventually you kind of get something that starts trapping the soil, right? It doesn't let it just blow away. And so here you have on the left right here, you have lichen. And lichen, sometimes you'll see it um, 
when you're out hiking or anything, especially here in this area, right? It's very rocky in central Texas. And so a lot of times you'll see lichen growing on there. And again, that lichen grows on there and it starts breaking down the uh, rock into soil, right? But then after that, on the right, right here, you see this is moss. And so moss, you can tell right there, just by the way it looks, right? That it can trap dirt and things like that. Just by dirt passing through there, it's gonna get stuck inside the moss. Right. And if dirt starts getting stuck inside the moss, you start getting that soil there. Then like what happens all of a sudden a seed comes and lands in that soil that's there. Right. This is what we're calling pioneer species because they're the first ones to settle there. Right. And once they do settle there, then they start trapping all of the things that you need to create uh, other living things, uh, to let other living things grow in that area. Right. But again, pioneer means the first ones to do it. And the lichen here on the left and the moss right here are pioneer species. Right. That's how you go from a non-living thing like this rock into all of a sudden you start having living things on there. Right. But it doesn't end with the moss. Uh, again, lichens break down soil. Sorry, break down rock to form soil. And then this low growing moss right here. Right. These plants will trap moisture and prevent soil erosion. And when you see that word erosion, y'all, it just means basically like if the wind blows, all the soil will get swept away. Right. And this happens a lot on our oceans and things like that. I remember uh, where I used to live by I didn't live right by South Padre Island, but I live close. But every now and then uh, after the holidays, they would ask people to go uh, donate their Christmas trees. And then they would go dump the Christmas trees there on the beach so that the trees could start trapping uh, soil so that it wouldn't all just get blown away. Right. And so erosion, again, just kind of means soil erosion just means that the soil gets blown away. Or sometimes I guess if it's by the water, the beach could also erode the soil. Right. So again, those pioneer species come in and uh, start laying down the groundwork uh, for primary succession. Right. Soil starts to form as lichen and mosses. And we saw those uh, just right here. Right. Lichens and mosses. Uh, the forces and the forces of weather and erosion, they help break down the rocks into smaller pieces. Right. So, again, we need soil. Soil is what traps seeds and other living things. And also when you have enough like things that have died there, like plants and even animals. Right. They provide like nutrients to that soil so that uh, the plants can feed off of that. Right. Plants need nutrients um, and they need water and sunlight. Right. So, again, the uh, lichen and mosses and the forces of weather and erosion, they break down the rocks into smaller pieces. And this is what eventually leads to soil. Right. When lichens die, they decompose. And they add small amounts of organic matter to the rock to make soil. And those are the nutrients, right? When I say nutrients, it basically means that organic matter. And all it is, y'all, is uh, if you've taken uh, IPC or chemistry, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, carb, all of these things, carbon, all of these things are nutrients, right? It's what the plants need to live. It's their food. And so it slowly starts getting created along with the soil. Right. So now you see that you're having the, the best type of environment for living things to, to keep growing. Right. And so here you see this. This is kind of like a tundra right here. Tundra happens in the cold and there's not very many living things there. Actually, it's starting to grow a lot more now that the, the planet is heating up. They're starting to see a lot more uh, growth where there never really was growth because now uh, it's hotter. So more things can survive, which sounds like a good thing. But in the long run, it's not right when the polar ice caps melt. Anyways, but this right here is what you see. You can see that it's rocky, right? Those are like just rocks uh, on the background right here. But then you start to grow the lichen, right? And the lichen starts breaking down the rocks into soil. And all of a sudden, like the moss is also growing there. So it starts trapping uh, dirt, right? So wind blowing dirt, the dirt gets stuck there. The lichen is also creating soil by breaking down the rocks. And then all of a sudden, uh, the wind blows and seeds get stuck in the dirt, right? And then those, um, the nutrients, the organic matter from the, the um, plants dying, right? Lichen dies and then eventually moss dies and it goes into the ground. It gets recycled and now there's food for the plants to eat, right? So now you start getting little flowers like these there. So again, going from rock and barren land into all of a sudden having living things, going from abiotic, non-living to biotic, living. Right. And here you have some more examples of that primary succession, right? You see the moss over here on the right and then on the left. Uh, this is a fern right here. This is some of the first uh, plants that will start growing in this primary succession, right? Very small, very short plants. You're not all of a sudden going to see this super tall tree growing out of primary succession. That takes a little bit of time, right? So it starts with like smaller plants. It starts with lichen and then moss. And then it goes into small plants like these ferns right here. So simple plants like mosses and ferns, right? That's what ends up growing in this new soil. Again, not super huge trees, but smaller, shorter plants. And so the simple plants die, adding more organic material or nutrients to the soil, 
right? So again, this is uh, the food that plants eat, right? They need those nutrients. And so here you see at the forefront where you have all those flowers, this is more like a primary succession uh, example in the front. The soil layer thickens and grasses, wildflowers, and other plants begin to take over, right? So there you see, again, that loy the, the soil gets uh, thicker, and then that means plants can have deeper roots, right? If a, tall, if a plant grows tall, that means that it kind of needs to have some deep roots, right? And if there's not a bunch of thick uh, soil layers, that means those roots cannot go very deep down, right? But now that it is getting deeper, that means that taller plants can grow because now they can accommodate the, the roots and how deep the roots need to go. Right, because whatever you see up top for a plant, it's pretty much the same size underneath the soil. And so seeds get carried away by the wind. And again, they get stuck in the soil. And now uh, seeds that need deep roots can start to grow. And so you start getting like bushes and shrubs and things like that, which again, not super tall trees, but you're kind of getting to the trees, right? These bushes and these shrubs are kind of like mini trees, little trees. So, but these plants die and they add more nutrients to the soil, right? So there you see the soil is getting deeper and deeper and there's becoming uh, more nutrient rich, right? There's more nutrients, there's more food there for the plants to eat in the ground. And so shrubs and trees, right? So now after you get the shrubs, eventually if the soil gets deep enough, you can start getting trees, right? So here at the beginning, you see the shrubs and then at the back, you start to get like the taller trees, right? So slowly the plants start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You go from lichen to moss to ferns to bushes and shrubs and then to trees. And so now insects, small birds and mammals have begun to move into the area because now they have places to live and they have food to eat. Right. And uh, because of that, there's less harm for predators. Right. Because they can get up in the trees or inside of the trees or in little caves or dig holes into the soil. Right. So now, you know, all of these living things, all of these animals start coming out of the um start coming into the, the biotic factors, start coming into the abiotic uh, area. And so what was once bare rock, right, now supports a variety of life. And so you kind of see that primary succession, how that starts with the pioneer species, right, the first ones, the lichen and the moss, and then it slowly starts to get bigger, the plants start to get bigger and bigger and bigger because the soil is getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're starting to get more nutrients in the soil. Right, so here you kind of see the, the picture of that. You start with the bare rocks over here, right? No living things, abiotic. And then all of a sudden some living things, uh, organisms, lichen, starts growing on the rocks, right? And they start breaking that rock, those rocks down into dirt, right? Into smaller pieces, into soil. And so here you see, right, it says pioneer stages. And then you have the mosses, right? The mosses are a little bit bigger than the lichen, but they're still very short, right? But they're capturing all that dirt, right? You start to see all this dirt getting captured in there. Again, it's like that carpet I was saying, right? Carpet attracts all kinds of dirt and like paper, little papers and things like that. It gets stuck in there. That's kind of what the moss is doing to the soil. And so now you start to see a layer of soil. Right. And now uh, after that, you start to see herbs and weeds. That's kind of like where the ferns were. Right. We were talking about ferns earlier. That's kind of where you see those right there. Still part of the pioneer stage because they're the first living things there. Right. You see them right here starting to collect in the soil and they can grow now because there's enough soil for the roots to go down in there. Right. And then all of a sudden you start getting grasses. This is the intermediate stage. And look at how much time that takes. Right. You may have uh, been looking like, hey, how how fast or you may have thought like I'd never see lichens breaking down rock. Yeah. You couldn't really sit around and watch that happen unless you plan to sit there for hundreds of years. Right. So it happens very, very slowly. And then you start getting grasses and look at the soil here. Y'all, you notice it slowly starts getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So that allows taller plants to grow, because, again, the taller the plant is above ground, it pretty much needs that much space below the ground for its roots, right? So grasses start growing, then shrubs, and intermediate just kind of means in the middle, all right? So then you have the pines and uh, hickories. Those are the trees right here, right? These are all kinds of trees, pines, hickories, and immature oaks. Just means young ones because oaks grow pretty tall, right? Then later over here, you see the climax community. And when you're talking about climax, y'all, you're basically talking about the, the top of something, right? Like the peak of something. So if you come to the climax of, of a movie, it's kind of like, where the most action is happening in that movie, right? If you're coming to uh, talking about like a mountain or something like that, you're pretty much getting to the top of the mountain, right? So uh, th those include oaks, hickories, black walnuts, and all of these trees right here, y'all, are tall trees, right? And you can see, not very clearly, uh, the picture's kind of fuzzy, but you can see the roots, right? They need some place to grow, and that's going to be down into the soil. And so on the star test, you can expect to see a question relating to... Um, 
these uh, the primary succession and a question like this, right? So it says communities and Enchanted Rock State Nat. So Enchanted Rock is not too far from here, maybe like an hour and a half. And so from Austin, right? I know some of you all aren't in Austin, but it's telling you here the type of community, open oak woodland, and then it tells you uh, several species of oaks, cacti, that kind of thing. And so when you're thinking about this, because the question is, a student studying primary succession should focus on which of these communities? Just think, y'all, right? Primary succession, those are the first ones. Primary means first. So if it's going to be one of the first ones there, that means they're going to be very short little plants. So which of these are, are like the smallest, shortest, least amount of plants? And maybe I guess not even plants, right? Just living things, because um, some of these things... Um, like lichen, right? A lot of times people don't even really think of lichen as a plant, but yeah, you got to be thinking about like the smaller uh, living things, right? The smaller producers. All right. And so this right here is a picture of a primary succession, but it's kind of going a little bit slow. Um, and so one sec, kind of wait for this to unload. And then here you'll see, um, this is what we're talking about, right? First, the uh, primary, uh, the lichen and the moss comes in and then it creates soil and then the grasses can come in and then the flowers and the plants and then the trees, right? The ones that need deeper roots, then those can come in and start to um, take over the area. We're going to see right now, though, how fire plays into this, right? Because there is actually something called secondary succession, which we're going to see right now in a little bit. But that has to uh, fire or other natural disasters like that um, are kind of paving the way for that secondary succession. All right. So here we go. This secondary succession. Remember, we were just talking about primary. So now we have the secondary succession and it begins in a place that already has soil. Right. So uh, we don't need the primary um we're not really talking about primary successions, right? We're not talking about um, the moss and the uh, lichen and all that. This is already beginning with soil, right? So soil was there and it was once home to living organisms, right? But something came and uh, happened that kind of got rid of those. So it occurs faster and has different pioneer species in the primary succession. All right, so here they mentioned pioneer species, but there are differences between pioneer, pioneer species for primary succession, which we just talked about a little while ago, and uh, pioneer species for the secondary succession. So a lot of times, like you saw in that little uh, animated picture before, this usually happens after forest fires, right? So that makes sense because a forest fire comes and it gets rid of all of those, um, the lichen, the moss, the grass, everything that was there gets burned down, right? But the thing about fires, y'all, is that it creates a lot of nutrients for the ground. So here you see that, right? You have... Um, well, you have the climax, right? We talked about like the peak, the very top where you have big, tall trees. And then all of a sudden, then you see those in number one. And then number two happens and you see the, the fire, right? The fire comes and starts burning those trees. And then by number three, the fire has completely burned everything in the area. And then you see number four right here. There are no, no trees, no grass, nothing, right? It is just soil, but there's already soil there, right? So you don't need lichen and uh, moss to trap the soil because it's already there. So this happens faster, right? Because there's already soil there. And now you start seeing some of these smaller plants starting to come in right here, right? And then it gets into the like the, the trees and the shrubs and the smaller trees. And then all of a sudden you get some of these taller trees. And then again, you have this climax over here, this climax um, environment right here where you have the tall, tall trees growing there, right? Remember, it takes time for that to happen. And these are like pretty much at the top until another fire or something comes and just kind of wipes everything out. And here again, sorry, I mentioned fire, but like if a volcano came through here, a volcano erupted and it just covered everything in lava, that would not be, um, that would go back to a primary succession, right? Because all of this soil, everything would get covered in, in lava. And when the lava cools down, it would turn back into rock, right? So sometimes these uh, secondary um, succession can actually, you know, revert back to the primary if something like that were to happen. But if it's just like a forest fire or like maybe, um, yeah, like a forest fire, right? All of this stuff gets burned down, but the soil is still there. But again, a volcano would have changed it back to primary. And so here you see that, right? This is more of the, the secondary succession. The first plants to come in are just smaller plants because there's already soil there. Right. But then as the time passes, you start to see a bigger and taller plants and then they get a little bit uh, taller, like these bushes and shrubs. And then you get some taller bushes and some smaller trees. And then eventually you get that climax community where you have super tall trees uh, with uh, really deep roots growing there. 
right? And so here you kind of see this right here, the annual weeds. So just like your typical weeds that you have growing would come up in about um, one year. And then uh, two to four years of annual and perennial weeds, so you kind of start seeing flowers and some taller weeds growing there. And then you see a hint, pine seedlings and saplings. So basically baby trees and bushes and shrubs. And then you start getting some after 25 to 50 years, they get a little bit taller, right? And then when you get to this mature hardwood forest right here, those have been growing for about 150 years, right? So again, we've just been talking about how you go from non-living abiotic factors into biotic factors or living things in an ecosystem, right? So how you go from um, nothing to, to something. And so here you just kind of see an actual picture of this right here. Um, so it looks like right here something came, maybe just plowed the field, right? Killed everything on the land, but left everything there. And so after a while, though, those things die, they're removed. But And it's pretty much just soil and some dead uh, branches and things like that. And then all of a sudden over here in B, you start to see some of those pioneer species coming in, right? Like the very low level, the, the very short little plants coming in. And then here on uh, C, you see a little bit of uh, taller plants coming in. Not super tall, still kind of short. But then when you get to D, you start to notice these little saplings and these little bushes or shrubs, and, and it's getting a little bit taller, right? And then eventually when enough time has passed right here, about after 20 years, the, the trees are mature and there are also birch and maple trees in addition to the blackberry shrubs, right? So the plants start getting taller in the secondary succession. And this was, again, an abandoned cornfield. Uh, I didn't mention that part. But after they plow the cornfield, you know, the, the soil is still left. And so that's where we get secondary succession. So aside from a fire, I guess plowing this field um, would be another example of that, of this abandoned cornfield. And so secondary succession, some seeds in the soil begin to grow and you can see the, the plants right here starting to come up and then larger shrubs move in, right? So they're getting a little bit taller, a little bit larger. Shrubs are just like bushes. And then the fast growing trees such as pines. So pines grow a little bit faster than hardwood trees. And so these start coming in. Um, and then finally, these are followed by slower growing hardwood trees, right? So you can see those down here at this uh, bottom picture right here. And so just a little recap, right? When you have the fire that ends up like burning everything, but the soil is still there. And so in zero years, right, you just pretty much have everything uh, there still, you know, dead. Nothing really is coming to life yet. And then after one to two years, you start to get some annual plants, right? The very short plants. The big thing, though, is, is to just kind of notice that the more time that goes by, the, the larger the plants start to get, right? Three to four years, it's grasses and perennials like these flowers. And then uh, after five, five to 150 years, you start getting grass, shrubs, pines and young trees, Right after 150 plus years, you get that climax community. Again, that's where the things are super tall, super big, and have really deep roots. So let, let's look at this question right here. Which statement best describes the differences in species diversity between an ecosystem beginning the process of primary succession and one beginning the process of secondary succession? Right, so remember that um, when they first start, they're just a few basic plants, very small, not very tall, not very deep roots. And again, not very many types of them. Starts off with like the, um, just the, the few grasses and per, uh, perennials and um, not a lot of diversity there, right? And so the more time passes, the more, um, the deeper the soil is gonna get, the deeper the roots are gonna get and the more variety you're gonna have, right? Different types of, of plants and more diversity. So the climax community is what we talked about um, earlier, right? It says a stable group of plants and animals that is the end result of the succession process. So remember, that's what I was saying. The climax is like when you come to, almost to the end, right? Like to the most um, action, like if we're talking about a movie or towards the top of a, of a mountain or a hill. And it does not always mean big trees. So in the cases we were seeing, right, it does mean big trees, but there are some places where trees don't grow, but those things have been around for a while, right? So these examples that they're showing you, the uh, grasses and prairies, right? Prairies just mean that it's a flat land with not very many trees, if any. So of course, we're not gonna get trees in a prairie area. Uh, in a cacti, sorry, in the desert, the cacti, right? If you go into a desert, you're not gonna see a lot of super tall oak trees and things like that. No, you're gonna see a cacti, right? But those cacti for that example, for that desert, those would be considered part of a climax community. And so here we see some, right? Again, if you're in a desert, you're not gonna see a lot of trees because there's not enough water and enough, um, uh, there's not a, 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 the right environment isn't there for trees to grow. Right. So again, if you're in a, a super dry desert, no. Right. If you're in a, a desert that gets some rainfall, you're going to get these little shrubs. But it's not until you get uh, more 
rainfall, right, that you're going to get these taller trees or the right kind of environment, right? The, the temperature also has to be in the right um, the right heat, right? You can't be super cold or you're not going to grow that many trees in the area. So this is a, these are examples right here of climax communities, right? And uh, the ones we saw before, right, those examples had tall trees. But if you're in a desert or somewhere where there's not any trees, then those... Um, those plants in the climax community, you know, they're not going to be tall trees. They're going to be smaller uh, living things. And so high levels of biodiversity, right? So that's what you see um, when, when you're talking about biodiversity, all you're basically talking about different types of plants growing there, right? Or different living animals growing there. If it's all just one type of grass or one type of, of animal living there, that means there's not a lot of biodiversity, right? And that happens at the beginning when you have those, uh, the primary succession at the beginning of primary and at the beginning of secondary succession, right? Not a lot of things have started growing yet. But when you have a uh, climax community, you have a lot of that, right? You have a lot of biodiversity of plants and animals. And it's stable, right? It's stable because uh, plants have, have grown there. So there's food, there's shelter for the animals. There's predators that come in there and they keep the, the, uh, the other animals in, in check, right? So their population doesn't grow too big. And this will persist after succession has finished until another disturbance clears the area, right? If a fire comes in and wipes everything out, then you're going to go into secondary succession. But if a volcano erupts and covers everything in rock, you're going to have to start over from that primary succession, right? With the lichen and then the moss. And so then just know that disturbance so reduces biodiversity. And that makes sense, right? You have all these living things, these plant, these grasses, these uh, flowers, these trees, these uh, insects and uh, squirrels and birds and foxes and wolves. And all of these things come and then they've settled down in the climax community. But then a disturbance like a fire or a volcano comes and it just reduces all of that biodiversity. Right. So threats to uh, climax communities. They include forest fires, which we've seen examples of right now, human activity, mowing, building, paving. Uh, we saw the, the, the abandoned cornfield earlier, right? When they harvest and they just leave everything there to die. Then there's flooding, volcanic eruptions, clearing a community for agricultural purposes, which is, I was just talking about the cornfield. Anything that destroys the existing community, uh, but much of the soil and some organisms remain, right? So that, those are the threats to those climax communities. And uh, here's something we talked about when we talked about uh, the symbiosis, right? That sometimes uh, species are introduced into an area that they don't really belong there. They, they uh, weren't naturally grown there, but someone brought in some seeds, someone brought in a plant, someone released a, an animal into the environment. And so now there are what are called invasive species taking over an area. Right. Thousands of non-native species, sorry, thousands of non-native invasive plants and animals have infested millions of acres of land and water across the nation. So this is why when people go through customs and things like that, they don't let you bring plants and they don't let you bring seeds and uh, animals and things like that, because we don't know the effect that they can have on our environment. Right. If you bring them over here. And so it causes massive disruptions in habitats by reducing biodiversity. Uh, you can see that over here on the right, these uh, vines have pretty much taken over the trees. They've taken over all the other plants and they're just growing and growing and growing and just pretty much wiping out everything that they come across. Right. So uh, and they degrade the health of our nation's ecosystems by wiping out all the native species. Right. And sometimes this happens with like fish. Fish get thrown into uh, a lake because they someone doesn't want it anymore or because um someone brought it accidentally and then they're just like, well, we need to let it go. And so they release them into the lake and all of a sudden that fish starts eating all of the fish in the um, in the lake. And those fish were food for something else. And now that thing doesn't have food to eat. And so all of a sudden, all of the fish start to die, all of the shrimp, all of whatever's in the lake will start to die, right? The clams or whatever. And so it costs $138 billion per year in damages and control costs, right? And so this is kind of... Um, this is a reason, right, why you got to be careful when we are um, dealing with our environment, right, especially, you know, releasing native things. If you have a fish that you no longer want, um, don't go dumping it into a uh, lake, especially if it is not native to that area. Right. So here you see that congan grass on the left and the kudzu vines on the right have taken over their area and um, nothing else is going to be able to live in those areas because they are taking it all over.